we get to it. And this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> so, um, so I'd like to just start by uh, welcoming you all today and, um, and uh, saying happy International Education Week. I don't know if you all know, but um, this program today specifically is sponsored by the Office of International Programs, um, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Office and the Programming Committee and the School of Medicine Office of Diversity. Um, and this is our Clinical Culture and Diversity Series. According to the Department of State, International Education Week, also known as IEW, this year is from November 16th through the 20th. And it's an opportunity to celebrate the benefits of international education in exchange worldwide. This joint initiative of the U.S. Department of State and the U.S. Department of Education is part of our efforts to promote programs that prepare Americans for a global environment and attract future leaders from abroad to study, learn, and exchange experiences. International Education Week is a week for celebration, a celebration of diverse cultures, languages, people, and the relationships and connections we have forged here and across oceans and continents. This is a time to celebrate our friendships and to celebrate in our collective and individual accomplishments. Today, we are ready for a celebration. After a very difficult year due to the complexities of COVID-19, which halted international mobility, as well as new and proposed immigration rules and presidential proclamations, which created additional uncertainty and anxiety, this week is our opportunity to stop and shine a spotlight on the wonders and wonderfulness of interacting with people from around the world. While international travel has halted, our international engagement has not been stopped. We continue to communicate and engage virtually with our friends and partners around the world. We have not been discouraged, we are not discouraged. Rather, we have been leveraging opportunities. OIP started a series called Foundations of Global Health it's a year long series of presentations geared to prepare our community to be leaders and catalysts of change who defeat health disparities by ensuring health equities. In the face of proposed immigration rules and changes, we at KMC have stood in solidarity with our international friends, colleagues, and coworkers. Here at KMC, we know better than anyone how much our international friends contribute to our community and how desperately we would miss any one of them if they chose to work, study, or do research elsewhere. Diversity is essential to creativity of thought and expanding our mental horizons and understandings. Simply put, we all need to interact with others who think differently and perceive the world differently as it makes each one of us better, smarter, and a little more empathetic and understanding. As Senator Fulbright stated, we must try to expand the boundaries of human wisdom, empathy, and perception. And there's no way of doing that except through education. The essence of intercultural education is the acquisition of empathy, the ability to see the world as others see it, and to allow for the possibility that others may see something we have failed to see or may see it more accurately. We know the value of individuals from around the world who come to the US to study and how their presence in America could contribute even more profoundly than the $41 billion they contribute yearly to higher education as reported by NAFSA, the National Association of International Educators. International students, Researchers and employees are part of the heart of our institutions and are woven into the beautiful tapestry of American higher education and American society. To say we are grateful for their presence seems grossly inadequate. We cannot imagine our lives here at KUMC without the presence of internationals and international exchange. So thank you. And with that, I will pass the baton to Dr. Sarah Kessler. 
Okay, thank you, Kimberly. And let's see, Christine or Alexa, are you pulling up slides? That would be Alexa. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Alexa. Okay, well, while Alexa is pulling those up, we just want to again welcome everyone to our second annual Dr. Mani Modelmani International Educational Exchange and Partnership presentation. And I first I want to appreciate the COVAC International Education Support Fund that first initiated this special annual presentation to recognize Dr. Mani Mani for his incredible leadership and the legacy at KUMC in global health exchanges. And so Dr. Mani Mani is a professor emeritus in the Department of Plastic Surgery, and he was recruited to KUMC by Dr. Robinson back in 1968 for his residency training in plastic surgery. And then he went on to join our faculty here at KUMC in 1972. And if we go to the next slide. So Dr. Mani has been a leader in burn care, both in our state of Kansas, um, where he really worked to build local capacity for burn care, but also in many other countries around the globe, including Kyrgyzstan, Malaysia, Australia, and India. And one of the principles that I think Dr. Mani has always emphasized and, and taught to all of us here um, was the importance of uh, and his commitment to using only materials that were available in the local settings as he um, trained and taught clinicians and students on burn care because it was really critical to him that this work would be sustainable and not leave after he or others left with more sophisticated equipment. And then next slide. So Dr. Mani and Mrs. Mani have been really instrumental in creating opportunities for interdisciplinary international education and institutional partnerships for our students and our faculty here at KUMC. And um, I want to make sure all the students who are listening are aware of the Robinson Scholars Program. It's for medical students, nursing students, and students in health professions um, to do an international exchange educational exchange at um, the Christian Medical College in Vellore, India, which is where both Dr. Mani and Mrs. Mani uh, worked in a cl as clinicians um, prior to coming to Kansas. And this is really a nice um, institutional partnership that we've developed between KUMC and CMC. And another aspect of this that both the Manis have brought to us has been uh, the Modal Scholars Program, in which junior faculty at CMC come and spend the fall semester at KUMC um, working on their research skills. Okay, next slide. I also wanted to take a moment to recognize and honor Dr. Mani's wife, Mrs. Rebecca Mani. And the photo in the middle that you see there, that was taken last year at our first annual Dr. Mani Mani uh, presentation. And, and so we lost Mrs. Mani this year and really uh, will miss her and want to honor her. The Manis now have the Rebecca Mani Clinical Scholars Fund in Dietetics and Nutrition. And this fund has been initiated in Mrs. Rebecca's honor and to um, help fund clinical dietitians at KUMC, but also to help fund um, other scholars internationally to come and receive this training and in, in our school here. So next slide, please. So I would now like to introduce our honored speaker for the 2020 Dr. Mani Modelmani International Educational Exchange and Partnership Pre Presentation, which is Dr. Natabona Mabachi. Dr. Mabachi is an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health. And she's a wonderful partner and friend in our research that in maternal and pediatric HIV work that we do in Kenya and in cervical cancer. Uh, Dr. Mabachi brings expertise in health communications, community-based participatory research, qualitative research methods, and a genuine passion 
to engage with vulnerable and underserved populations, both in the US and Kenya, which are both of her home countries. So most recently, her research has focused on innovative solutions to promote cervical cancer screening and treatment among women living with HIV in Kenya. So without further ado, Dr. Mabachi, we look forward to hearing about your collaborative research and partnership building in Kenya. Wow, thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Mani and um, international programs and for that lovely introduction, Sarah. Um, Alexa, do you have my PowerPoint? This is it. So, gosh, I'm so excited to share with you the story of the cancer tracking system um, that we have been piloting. We just finished the pilot in Kenya and had been doing so for the last year. We got funding from the KU Cancer Center to adapt Sarah's work, Sarah and Brad Gottney's work, which is the HIV infant um, tracking system. Because we saw parallels between what was going on with HIV and what was going on with cancer in Kenya. Um, so next slide. Today, um, I'm, I want to talk about where it all started, and that's with the um, Sarah and Brad's pr um, project, which is the HIV infant tracking system, from which we adapted um, the CATS system, which is the cancer tracking system, and we have been focusing on cervical cancer. But all of this stemmed from um, the increasing realization that cancer is such a huge issue in sub-Saharan Africa and Kenya is, has not been exempted from that. And particularly for women, breast and cervical cancer have been um, reasons for high um, uh, mortality and um, poor, poor health outcomes. So I wanna talk a bit about that, talk a bit about some of the outcomes we want and share a bit what the cancer tracking system looks like, what it does, and also some of the challenges and lessons that we have learned as we are going to move on to scale up um, our system. So next slide. This all began with the HIV infant tracking system, which is a system that Sarah, Dr. Sarah Kessler and her partner, Brad Gottney, developed to address some of the major gaps that existed in the Kenya cascade of healthcare for early infant diagnosis. So there were discrepancies between the communication with provider and mom. There were discrepancies between communication with provider and lab. Um, and so they wanted to find ways to um, close that loop and, and reduce the number of uh, deaths that were happening, unfortunately, um, preventable deaths from, from lack of early infant diagnosis. Next slide. So this is what it was, um, the system was basically devised to do. Um, provide, provide, um, give providers electronic alerts when service was late or when it was missing. Give electronic alerts to lab techs when um, their samples came in and whether those samples, uh, the results were delayed in getting back to the hospitals. And also provide automated texts between mother and hospitals so that they, they were um, notified if they missed um, service, if they missed appointments, when their results were ready, if clinical action was required. And she probably watched her presentations, but this was really hugely successful and has been implemented in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Malawi. Um, and I think that's an attestation to its success. So next slide. As I mentioned, we noticed parallels between HIV and cancer in Africa. For both issues, there's insufficient provider and population knowledge of prevention and treatment, although that's improving. These are limited, um, there's limited infrastructure. Treatment is scarce and prioritized often for end-stage patients. With HIV, there's a lot of stigma, um, high stigma, but with cancer, there is still some stigma, and I think that's related to lack of knowledge. And all of this is happening in the context of limited resources. So that was one of the reasons we thought this would be a really good way for us to address at the systems level some of the gaps that exist in the Kenya healthcare system with regards to cervical cancer screening. Next slide. So here is the context for you. Cancer is the second leading cause of non-communicable deaths after cardiovascular diseases in Kenya. And there has been a rising mortality from cancer between 1990 and 2013. Honestly, there is nobody that I know personally in Kenya who hasn't had somebody in their family or a friend who has passed away from cancer 
and from preventable cancers like cervical cancer. This has led to the Ministry of Health really increasing its commitment to reduce cancer mortality, um, and it's reflected in their 2017-2022 cancer control strategy. Next slide. So here you can see the burden for cancer. The thing that I really want to point out to you is that there are 35 oncologists in Kenya that are dealing, having to deal with this issue, and that is absolutely huge. And we only right now have two referral centers where patients can go to, for comprehensive cancer care. And this is serving about 42 million Kenyans. Um, so you can see the, the, the profound um, need that is going on with regards to just cancer in general. Um, when you look at uh, cancer cases for women, you can see that cervical cancer and breast cancer are really the leading cancers in Kenya. And as the next slide shows, um, and Alexa, just advance until all the animation is sort of gone. The next slide shows that the number of new cases in, in 2018, um, cervical cancer ranked second um, and breast cancer ranked number one. Um, but when it came to the number of deaths, cervical cancer was second and breast cancer ranked three. So for something that's so preventable, it's really a shame that we're not reaching women in time. And that's, that's really sort of where we wanted to get to. Let's get to these women in time. Let's get to them before they're at stage three, stage four, where is usually where we found them. And let's get them treated. Next slide. So we know that it's presentable, the, um, but only 3.5% of the 10.3 million eligible Kenyan women are actually screened. And that's, that's quite profound. Um, and of these, 80.5% present with advanced, so at least stage 2B or above stage of the disease. And we shouldn't really be um, getting to that space. But like I mentioned, next slide, we have barriers to care. So Kenyatta National Hospital is our leading referral hospital. And you can see in the picture, I think you noticed Dr. Girard. Well, he came to visit um, Kenya, uh, was it two years ago, Sarah? Um, and we came with a whole team of folks, including Kimberly. Um, and we visited some of these facilities. And we went to Kenyatta National Hospital where a new cancer center was launched in 2017. Over 40,000 patients are referred to KNH. Um, that's where you can get your surgery, your radiotherapy, your systemic therapy. We only have three oncology machines serving these patients. And I think Kimberly and, and um, Sarah, you remember seeing some of those machines. This is an overwhelmed referral hospital, and it's one of two tertiary hospitals that folks are referred to. So next slide, some of the barriers we're seeing with the cascade of care for cancer is inadequate monitoring and evaluation. We just have had disjointed gathering of data. Um, we have our, our provincial hospitals and our local hospitals still today use paper um, records that are not kept very well. Um, we didn't have a central system through which we could funnel all this data, uh, but we do now have the Kenya National Registry, which I will talk a bit more about. That was recently launched, um, and one of our team members actually played a key role in helping to launch that, so we're very proud of that. The other thing is low knowledge of common symptoms of cancer, um, of cervical cancer. We know that we need to continually educate our providers, but at the lower levels of, of, of hospital in the provincial areas, in the rural areas, it's very hard to provide that continuing education. Um, we know that there's stigma attached. This is due to lack of knowledge, and it's not just with patients, it's also with providers as well. Um, so that's another knowledge gap. As with many low resource areas, um, countries, we have limited treatment facilities, as I've sort of shared. We have limited number of providers who are experts or trained in this field. We have limited equipment. Um, and so there are a lot of things that are sort of against funneling people into screening programs because of these limitations. The other important thing that was, was happening was that a lot of our policymakers and folks in the 
healthcare fields in our county government who are not prioritizing cerv cervical cancer or cancer generally as an area that we really need to focus on as a country. However, next slide shows this started changing when really prominent Kenyans started dying and at a young age. So you can see um, our minister, a prime, um, a Kibera representative died of cancer at 41. Bob Collymore was the head of our largest phone company, um, Safaricom, and he recently died of cancer. Um, we have Bomet Governor Joyce. She recently, she was also in her 40s and she died of cancer. Um, and there's also studies that were showing there was all kinds of sort of bias and lack of knowledge that was affecting care, the cascade of care, bad attitudes among amongst providers, there was victim blaming, people, you know, providers blaming uh, patients that they weren't coming in early enough, weren't getting their proper screenings. That led to, next slide, actual demonstrations. So a year and a half ago, we had cancer patients and their carers walking the streets calling for the Kenyan government to call this a national disaster. People were tired with the lack of affordable treatment. People were tired with the lack of specialists. People were tired with the lack of equipped hospitals and also with how they were being treated and how their families were being treated. They didn't feel that there was the proper support and that they were alone. Um, and so the government has listened and this has become one of the main priorities in government health at the moment. Next slide. So this is the context with which we sort of entered the scene. And we entered it, I think, at a really opportune time where people's consciousness about cancer and about women's consciousness about cervical cancer was really, um, was heightened. We recognized that, yes, there are patient barriers to uh, getting screened. Um, however, we also recognized that the gaps at the systems level were really um, important for us to look at and to address because we know that what happens at the systems level can also affect what's happening at the patient barrier level as well. So our solution was create an accessible systems level tool that will help to improve screening, treatment, referral, and follow-up rates um, amongst Kenyan women for cervical cancer. So this is where we applied, next slide, we applied for funding um, from the Kenya Cancer Center and we got, a really, we got some small funding to start a pilot. And the, the, our objective was to adapt the HIT system, which I spoke, to, spoke about earlier, and use the same sort of principles and create a tracking system to help engage and retain childbearing age women and follow them throughout the whole cascade of cervical cancer care. Because what was happening, and as, as you'll see from our six-month retrospective, there were so, patients were not being followed up. There were so many gaps where patients weren't coming back for testing, weren't getting treated, weren't getting referred if they, if they had cancer, um, and so patients were falling off. So we conducted our study in, in, about, in three phases. The first was formative, where we basically just engaged with our providers, because that is such a key part of research when you're working in low resource settings or in any setting. We do that here when we're doing community work as well. Talk to the folks who are on the ground, who are experiencing this day to day. How, how is this affecting your care? How is this affecting the hospital? What, what are the challenges you're experiencing? What are the challenges you're seeing that your patients are experiencing? Um, so we, dis we had key informant interviews with providers. We spoke with women about the challenges they were facing and, and you, the challenges were what you expect. Um, for providers, they just didn't feel like they had enough training. They didn't have enough equipment. Um, there was so much turnover in regards to who is providing the care. So there was no consistency. Um, there were so many points of testing and nobody was coordinating. And then focus group discussions with women, they talked about barriers such as cost, barriers such, such as getting to um, the hospital. Some women were like, I didn't even know that I had to do this screening um, for HIV positive women. There were also other barriers because they have to be screened more often. Um, so there were all of those sort of barriers that we were able to sort of recognize and incorporate and think about as we're creating the algorithms for the cancer tracking system. 
phase two was a really important phase because this is the phase where we made the conscious decision to hire a Kenyan programmer to um, program the cancer tracking system. So usually what would happen with American funding is you'll get an American programmer um, and they will sort of work with you and maybe speak to a couple of people in the Kenyan end and try and figure out how to develop this system. We know from past experience that doesn't work. We also knew that Kenyan programmers know their context best. So we hired Kevin Oyoe, who is just programmer extraordinaire. I love this guy. And we were able to give it, get him um, a scholar's uh, fund. And with the help of Kimberly, we got him to Kansas. And he spent time with us in Kansas working on the system. Um, and he just developed a beautiful system, as, as you'll see from some of the screenshots. This system follows the Kenyan guidelines because we knew that whatever we have in the system has to reflect the data that the Kenyan government is, is collecting and has to reflect the priorities for data for the Kenyan government. And we also wanted our system to be able to talk easily with other systems. And that's another reason why Kevin was so important to this. Um, yes, Todd, Kevin is awesome. So important to this because he was already working with the Kenyan systems and knew what was going on, something that an American programmer would never have been able to know. And then our third phase was implementing the CAT system, which we did with many challenges over the course of um, roughly six months. And we then were able to compare that with historical rec retrospective clinical re uh, data. And so our phase four, which is going to be happening hopefully in the following years, is we're going to scale up. We're looking for big funding to scale this up to other hospitals in Kenya. We know that we, our partners in Kenya are interested in this happening, so that's something that we're working on. Next slide. Oh, sorry, there was the animation, I forgot. Um, these were some of, these were our primary outcomes that we're really looking for. We were looking for the proportion of women with a positive screening result who received treatment on site for precancerous lesions. The Kenyan government guidelines were, if you get um, screened, let's try and get you treated that very day. Because one of the barriers that women faced was when they go back to back home, coming back is difficult. Or um, we wanted to remove that barrier of leaving and coming back and get them screened and treated on that day. The other part that we knew wasn't happening was the referral to other hospitals or to the um, you know, Kenyatta National Hospital to get treatment. So we needed to be able to follow up women and make sure that they were referred and treatment was initiated once they were referred. Next slide. We were, excuse me, really also interested in some clinical outcomes. We wanted to see, could CATS be um, a, a tool that would help with planning and patient management? Could CATS be something that could help test the efficiency and effectiveness of, of how they were doing things in the clinic, the current workflow? Could it help us find gaps that would help us enhance workflow? Could it help with quality control? Could it help with longitudinal tracking of patients? Could it help with resource planning? So all of these things are things that providers told us in their, in the inter key informant interviews that they were interested in finding out. Um, and could it also help support a multidisciplinary team approach? Because what was happening is that providers were working in such silos that patients were falling through the gaps. And we saw the CAT system as an opportunity to bring all providers together to be able to look at cases, discuss, share knowledge, make plans. Um, so those were some of the clinical outcomes that our providers were specifically interested in. Next slide. So I want to tell you a bit about what the CAT system can actually do. i um, show you a bit of what Kevin's work is. Next slide. So the CAT system is basically um, a really great tracking tool. It shows us the number of patients. Once a patient is um, entered into the system, it shows us the number of patients who need specific types of follow-up um, through a dashboard. Um, it shows actions that need to occur through the dashboard, like do we need to follow up with a patient? Does the patient need to be referred? Does the patient need to be reminded to come back? Um, it provides, it gives providers alerts as to what is pending, what they need to do. It also alerts patients 
as well. So next slide, through SMS texts. So through SMS text messages, we're able to give our patients appointment reminders. We're able to um, customize text messages for each patient as needed. We're able to customize through in languages that our patients who are feeling comfortable with. And all of this is sort of algorithm driven and automated and built into the system. Next slide. The other thing that the system was really good at is Kevin made it so that we can upload images of cervixes, um, et cetera, before and after, so that we can actually visually track patients as they're treated which is such a great, I think, um, function. Because what it also enabled us to do is for people who had access, it can be a collaborative and consultative tool no, that can not only be used in the clinic across Kenya, but also globally with providers here um, if, if, if um, providers were stumped in the, at the Kenya end. And we, we made sure, of course, that security is really important. So only those who, are, who have access are able to see it. It's all stored securely. Um, and, and we're working with, and we have been working with also Kansas, our Kansas IT folks to make sure that all data is secure across countries, because that's really important as well. Next slide. The other thing that it does is it provides, as you can see, monthly calendar appointments, Next slide. Um, and it, so that's the appointments diary and you can see dates, how many people are pending and what needs to be done. So that's great for a provider as they're scheduling. Next slide. Um, and, and it also um, provides like data, like date of HIV diagnosis, date of screening results and all of that stuff. So this is the part that Kevin really talks about and it's the technical part, so I'm not going to go into it. But it's at the core of it, it's a data dictionary which stores all potential medical data that is relevant for the care of that patient from the moment they're screened to the moment that they're referred or they're treated and discharged from, from, um, from, being, from the cascade of care. Next slide. So that's a bit about, that's just a very brief um, insight into what the system looks like. So while Kevin was building that system, our site coordinator, Elizabeth, was tasked with conducting a six month screening retrospective. And this turned out to be even more difficult than we anticipated. Because screening at this particular facility happens in three places. Happens at the CCC, so that's the um, HIV care unit. Happens at the MCH, which is the mother um, maternal health care unit, family planning unit, and happens in the general outpatient unit. So she had to go to these different departments and track down these paper-based big books and look through to see what, who has been screened and all of this data that is based on um, data points that our national healthcare, that the healthcare institute wants. What we found out was that people were very poor at record keeping. Um, we found out that out of all of those, um, all of those different screening points, 200 and, uh, 1,056 had been screened and there was almost, I don't know, 500 points of missing data. Um, so 206 people got screened via PAP, 992 got screened by VIA Vili, which is a visual screening method, which is best for low resource settings because not many people can actually afford the cost of pap smears. And out of those, 1,006 were negative, 50 were positive. But this treated column is really where it, it was kind of bothering to us. Two of the positive were referred to theater that we know of and probably got treated. Two were referred to room 22. Room 22 at this particular facility is actually the room where you get um, uh, cryotherapy done, where you get treated. And for 46 of them, we didn't know what happened. The records didn't tell us. And it was really difficult for Elizabeth to figure that out and, and track that down. Um, and just in this, as an aside, to show you the HIV positive population amongst these women was pretty big because 428 of these women were HIV positive. 
I give you this little snapshot just to show you how inconsistent and incomplete the data was. And so this was such a good opportunity for us to show that it's possible through the CAT system to have a complete set, a comprehensive set of records of, of the patient from the moment that they entered into the system to the moment that they discharged, discharged out of the system. Next slide. Oh, this is just a picture. Can you see the book that the young lady has? That is what the registry looks like. And by the way, this looks super organized. Usually it's a bunch of really thousands of books and files and, and it's all over the place and you don't know how anybody finds anything. And it's such a challenge for anyone who wants to do some kind of retrospective review. Next slide. The other thing that we did, and this was with money from Frontiers, is that we bought our site new technology to use um, as they were screening patients. We did this because we, the traditional method they were using for, um, for treatment was cryotherapy. And cryotherapy is unwieldy. You have to have CO2. It's not very portable. It's difficult to go into, out into the community with. And so um, the, these uh, thermocoagulators had just come out in the market and had been proven from a couple of studies to be a portable, safe, and easy way to treat and much cheaper than cryotherapy. So with Frontiers Funds, we bought a couple of thermocoagulation material, um, uh, machines. We also bought pocket colposcopes. So when you're visually doing the visual screening via Vili, you're using your naked eye. And when you use your naked eye, you are prone to making mistakes. What the pocket colposcope did was it allows you to use your mobile phone, any mobile smartphone device, and you can insert the um, colposcope and it shows you a really nice picture of the cervix. Not only that, it can take a photo of that picture. And if you're feeling a bit doubtful, if a nurse was feeling a bit doubtful about whether um, there were precancerous cells, she could then use that photo to refer with somebody else, even if they weren't in the facility. Um, so that was great. Next slide. Here's a much closer picture of what a thermocoagulator looks like. So while cryotherapy uses cold to um, sort of uh, to get rid of the precancerous lesions, thermocoagulators use heat. That's what it looks like. So next slide. As part of um, providing this technology, of course, we had to provide training. So an integral part of any work that we do, even with um, the work that we've done with uh, Sarah's T with the HIV tracking system is lots and lots of training and lots and lots of engagement. So here's a picture of us trying to teach folks of May, who you'll see her picture later, trying to teach folks how to use the thermocoagulator and how to use the um, pocket colposcope. And they were super excited that they had this opportunity. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about what happened with that. Next slide. We did find challenges, however. So at Nakuru Provincial Hospital, which is a level five hospital, so that's pretty high up, there are few providers who provide screening, two to three, for all these patients. Not only that, when we were there, one of them was retiring. So we were tasked with finding other providers who were interested enough to do continuing education among, um, to do vis uh, visual screening, to get trained in using the thermocoagulator, to get trained in using the pocket colposcope. Um, so that was a huge part of what we had to do in order to get the project going, was to just get people trained up in the first place. And if anybody has worked in global health, you'll know that that has some logistical challenges um, and getting um, incentivizing people to get trained can also be uh, a bit difficult sometimes. As, as I mentioned before, inconsistent records across all the three points of screening. Um, it was really difficult to get the kind of data that we wanted to start. Um, and so what that made us realize is that, is that the dis the screening efforts were disjointed. The several screening points meant that different kinds of records were being kept. People weren't really talking to each other about what was happening in their different departments. Um, and so patients were falling through the gaps. And I'll talk of specifically about one patient who almost fell through the gaps. And then of course, training was needed. Um, 
one of the major obstacles that we faced because we weren't getting so although we were enrolling patients we weren't getting as many patients treated once they were diagnosed and so may and elizabeth who are on the ground like had to probe people and we found out that our nurses just weren't comfortable just weren't confident in using the thermocoagulator um, so that was um, something that was really a problem that we had to deal with and we needed to rely on our um, oncologist champions to help with training our providers our nurses and our clinical officers and then of course covid that put a kibosh on so many things the hospital literally shut down so that may, meant that enrollment went was on a go slow screening was on a go slow um, and that just had so many implications next slide so I want to tell you about Mary. And Mary was one of our, our patients who, she was a 45 year old patient. She's got three children. She's HIV positive. She's single. And she was referred to Nakuru because they noticed a mass. And the minute she came in, they're like, ooh, this doesn't look good. So she was immediately referred to minor theater. So her referral to minor theater ended up being for January the 16th. So she went to minor theater, they did a colposcopy, they extracted the biopsy, and they also staged her cancer. And they found out that she had stage four cancer. February 5th, she went back to the um, hospital and the biopsy results confirmed that she had cervical cancer. They did a CT scan of her abdomen and her pelvis, and it was, going to like go on and on at the Nakuru facility in regards to sort of being passed back and forth between departments. That was where Elizabeth, our study coordinator, recognized that if we did not get her to care fast enough, then the outcomes would be dire. So she stepped in and she had a conference with all the providers who were necessary for um, that patient's treatment, and she said, "We need. Don't you think we need to have her referred to KNH ASAP?" So during that February fifth meeting, they all agreed. Yes, let's just write the referral letter to Kenyatta National Hospital and get her started. So behind the scenes, Elizabeth works to get that referral letter written. February twentieth, that referral letter happens. Um, and February 26th, the client finally gets to Kenyatta National Hospital. Mind you, from Nakuru to Kenyatta National Hospital is about one and a half hours, two hours away. But as a single parent, she had to look for childcare. There were a lot of logistics that she had to figure out. We also paid for her transport to Kenyatta National Hospital, and we also paid for her stay there. These were some of the barriers that she just wouldn't have been able to overcome on her own. Once she was at Kenyatta National Hospital, they did baseline tests and they found out that her hemoglobin levels were very low. So that meant that she needed a blood transfusion before they were going to start any kind of chemotherapy. She had to go back to Nakuru two hours away. She had to be admitted on March the 11th. March the 18th, she had her transfusion. Um, and then April 6th, she was back at KNH for her first radiation set, um, session. All the stuff that happened with her blood transfusion, her transport back to KNH, all of that, Elizabeth and May are the ones who organized it. I say all of that because this is something that Mary would never have been able to manage on her own without the support of our project. And it just showed the many sort of gaps, both at the um, sort of in the process level at the, at, at, at Nakuru Provincial, and just the patient barrier levels that wouldn't have been able to have been overcome if our folks weren't able to step in. So that's the case of Mary. Next slide. So this is just very initial um, de descriptives from what we, the data that we got back. So in our six month enrollment, of all the patients who um, went through um, were screened and we have all the other follow-up results for them. We had 40, 485 patients who were screened. Of those, 88 were screened through um, 
HIV care, 27 through outpatient, and most of them through maternal health. 70% um, were HIV negative, 126 were positive, and eight were unknown. Most of them, 82.9%, did the VIA VILI visual screening, and we used our pocket colposcopes for that. Um, of the 40, of the of of those, 349 were negative and 32 were positive and three were suspicious for cancer. Out of all of those, 240, as compared to our three six our six month retrospective, 240 were screened and treated the same day, which for us we were like, woo, yes, because that just wasn't happening. And if it was happening, it wasn't recorded, and I bet you it wasn't to the level of 240. Um, the ones who needed rescreening, 52 came back for their two week rescreening. The ones who needed rescreening were ones who were probably found to have had an STI or something else that needed to be treated before they were screened. Seven postponed treatment, and Mary um, was treated for cervical cancer. I now know that the other two were also referred for treatment um, to Kenyatta National Hospital. So next slide. Here are some of our lessons learned. The team matters. There is no way that we could do this without our Kenya team at all. Um, Elizabeth was key. May was key. Our facility champions were amazing. Um, they, those doctors were the energy that they have between working for the hospital and working for their private practice was astounding. Training, training, training is so key for our providers on the ground and giving them the confidence through training. Flexibility. A lot of things happen on the ground when you're working in the global health context. Um, and you just have to go with the flow. You have to be really creative and nimble and able to pivot and come up with solutions. Um, and so that is key. Sometimes it's almost like you're operating in the Wild West, but when you, when you have a great group of folks together, gosh, there's nothing that can't happen. Next slide. Collaborations are also key. In this slide, you'll see um, in the next, in between Sarah and May, May. May is the one with the red jacket. She's our GHI person on the ground. She's amazing. Is Anne Career, who's the head of our Kenya National Cancer Registry. And she has been really interested in what we're doing. And she, the minute she learned what we're doing, she's like, how can we collaborate? How can we work together? And so what happened is Kevin, he's the guy in the middle with the shades, he helped um, Anne and they were able to get their um, cancer registry up and running and operating. And that is now operating in Kenya when she learned of what he did with the cancer tracking system. She was so impressed. And, and Camry, our Kenya Medical Research Institute, of which Anne is a part, was so impressed as well. Um, so right now, we, are, we collab collaborate really closely with the Kenya Medical Research Institute, Kenya National Cancer Registry, which is really Anne and her, her, two, her two helpers, and the Kenya National Cancer Institute, which is our uh, NCI's arm that exists in Kenya. Um, so they, we're all aware of what's happening and we all support us, uh, um, each other in the work and we collaborate a lot. Final slide. When I say team is important, I just can't underscore it enough. Ke Kevin, our programmer extraordinaire. May, who is a nurse, um, who is a problem solver, who is a community engaging person. I mean, I don't even know where we would be without these folks. And I'm loving on Elizabeth because she's the person who was on the ground every single day, enrolling patients, troubleshooting, working with providers, solving problems. Um, and I, I just love her for it, and I love her for her dedication. And with that, I thank you all for your time, for listening. If you have any thoughts, if you have any questions, happy to hear them. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mabachi. I, uh, um, I just, I'm struck at how natural collaboration comes to you. Um, you don't just speak about a few people. It's this whole 
community at both KUMC and in Kenya that is just intertwined. Um, you know, your connections at KUMC are expansive and we don't always see that even in global health, our global health faculty, sometimes they're very siloed, you know, and they're working on their own, but this group, your team and, you know, Dr. Kessler, you guys know I call you the dream team, but I think that that's your key. And I don't know if you could speak to that for a moment, um, Dr. Mabachi. Yeah. I mean, I think Sarah and Brad was such a great example for me. And I just, I'm so um, honored that I got to work with y'all, Sarah, because you showed what reciprocal collaboration needs to look like. And whether or not that you consciously thought about it, you were definitely using a sort of equity framework to the work that you are doing, where collaboration is not a top-down thing, where we are very sort of aware of the power differentials that may happen when you're coming from an American institution, working with Kenyan institutions, empowering the folks in Kenya on the ground to be able to make decisions, to be able to be creative, to take charge. And when you do that for people, my gosh, what they come up with is 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 so amazing we would never have thought about it um and so part of that uh kimberly is is trust trust is so key and trust doesn't happen overnight this has been years in the making honestly my can the cancer tracking system program is piggybacking over over 10 years of relationship building um, and engagement with 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 Kenyans Kenyan researchers, um, and so and the other thing I'll add to that is that trust can be easily broken. So we are always going back. We are always giving opportunities for our Kenyan team to be able to talk about what they're doing. Um, we're always giving them opportunities to expand their roles to think about you know what how else can they contribute. So. I'm so thrilled that May is going to be starting her PhD. We were so thrilled to be able to bring Kevin over. And by the way, he impressed programmers here. They were like, what? So it goes to show you that reciprocity is a two-way street, right? Yeah. I have a question, Dr. Mabachi. Yeah. Um, and thank you so much for this presentation. It was amazing and your work um what is the situation for like gardasil or if they have um i'm not sure what other versions of that vaccine are um but what is the situation um on cervical cancer um, or i guess hpv vaccinations in kenya is that something that is utilized or is it um like not enough people um, receive it i'd love to hear about that that is such a good question. So um, we've had problems with uptake for the HPV vaccination. Uh, two and a half, three years ago, a pilot project happened where um, there was vaccination of school-aged girls only from the ages of 10, 9 to 14 that was attempted. One of the things that came out from that pilot is the same things that we found here. Parents were sort of in an uproar why are you vaccinating our girls? They didn't. They immediately went to, it's gonna encourage them to engage in promiscuous behavior. Um, the other part of it is that HPV vaccines are costly. Um, they're very expensive. And when we looked at including HPV vaccination as part of our pilot, we were like, nope, it's not even a thing, can't do it. Um, so, that is an area that we are definitely working on. And I know that the Kenyan government is looking at to expand. Right now, we are also only focusing on women when we know we should be focusing on both boys and girls, men and women as well. Uh, so they're both cultural as well as just um, practical logistical factors, cost factors that need to be worked out. But we know that that is where we need to be going. We know that the HPV vaccination is where we need to be. And I think the more projects that can show the feasibility and acceptability of doing this, then the better the uptake will be with our county health departments and our national health departments. So we hope that we'll be able to have that as part of what we do in the next iteration of the CAT, CAT system, yeah. Mm -hmm.
There are a lot of comments in the chat box, chat box, which we'll download for you. Not so much questions, but just saying oh. what a great presentation it was. Um, anyone can take off their mic and ask a question. Dr. Kessler, I don't know if anyone, Dr. Mani, Dr. Well, Natty, thank you um, for such a great presentation, and I just love your presentation style. You're so engaging with your, um, you know, bringing us into the story. Um, so oftentimes, you know, especially as we talk about expanding global health at KUMC, a lot of times, you know, people appreciate hearing about how what we learn here translates um, to our global health work, but what we learn in our global health setting, how it translates here. And I wonder if you had any comments to add about ways that this global health work has strengthened or informed some of the work you do with uh, populations in the United States. So oh, thanks for that, Sarah. It's funny you say that because um, there's a project that my colleague Crystal Lumpkins and I have been working on um, trying to address breast cancer disparities in Kansas, the Kansas area, both in Kansas and Missouri, Kansas City area. And one of the things that we have been thinking about is using the lessons that we have learned in Kenya with regards to system level barriers because it's because what we're finding out is some of the system level barriers that are happening in Kenya are some of the system level barriers that African American women are facing here. And we were like, oh my gosh, this could be a really great opportunity to even adapt the CAT system specifically to follow our African American women as they go through the cascade of care in the Kansas City metro area. Um, and, and use basically use all the same concepts and ideas and learnings that we have had from the Kenya pilot and use that for this specific population. We've also had conversations with other folks who work in rural Kansas who see this as something that can be utilized in rural Kansas as well. Um, and I think that is such a good example of how what happens globally can be local and what happens local can be global. Um, so right now we're sort of looking for funding to do that, applying for certain grants to be able to try and see what this would look like here. And, you know, folks like um, at Susan G. Coleman are really interested in the idea as well. So, you know, maybe this would be another uh, presentation I'll be giving one day. Let's hope. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Mani, you did a lot of work out of the country. I was wondering, and this is in your honor, um, having worked with different populations and listening to Dr. Mabachi, do you have any questions or comments on her work? You're, you're muted. Yeah, I would say she's going in the right direction. Congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Mani. Yeah. That's, a, that's so nice coming from you. <laughs> Dr. Kovac, your fund uh, supports this and you're very involved in global health as well. Do you have any comments um, on Dr. Mabachi's work or questions? Well, I just, I, I applaud her efforts and I, I think she mentions the, the importance of having a team effort and good connections. Uh, uh, with the the host uh, country and institution, and it's it's an ongoing effort. Uh, as I recall from her presentation, that as much as maybe eight or ten years they've been working on this. So uh, it's it gives us an example that these are long term efforts uh, that need to be uh, continued and strengthened. And uh, I, I mean, I I really applaud uh, their uh their their project thank you dr kovac thank you dr mani and do we have any last questions we're at the hour anyone okay well dr mabachi wonderful presentation i always enjoy i always enjoy you i enjoy what you have to share you're a very great presenter um very captivating. So thank you for your time. Thank you for the gift of your research and for sharing that with us today in honor of Dr. Mani and International Education Week. 
We really appreciate you and we applaud you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Okay. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.